project, you guys, as you know, are going to be building your own version of Git called Gitlet. Uh, and this time, I'm not going to go through and explain exactly what all the commands do and all that stuff, uh, because hopefully you've already done that for that uh, lab. Uh, so before we get started with uh, the what next part, I'll mention uh, I'd like a little feedback on how you feel about what we do with this project. So rather than having me do the walkthrough in the video, we instead made it a more active exercise that you guys work through in lab. Um, so let me know if you liked that, and also give me a little feedback on whether or not you found this to be a, a useful exercise, that is, doing the design reviews. Uh, so anyway, so moving on then beyond the explanation that's already been rolled into this, uh, hoping it was more active, uh, let's talk about how to proceed. So um, I guess before you step into it, it's probably a good idea to know what is it that I'm supposed to learn from this project? Because it's a little bit of a fork from the rest of the class in the sense that uh, we've been following some course of action, uh, and then we are at this point going to take a little side trip where the main lecture is going to keep going through sorting, whereas this project's not going to be about sorting at all. It's just going to go off in this other direction, and then we'll merge back at the end of the week. Uh, so the goal here is we want you to have the ability to design and implement a large system from scratch. That is, we want you guys to do a little bit of API design. Uh, so while we could have done something that maybe plays into the current part of the course material, it just seemed cooler to work through Git this semester. And again, let us know if that feels like a bit too much of a departure, but we thought it would be really neat. And a lot of us on the staff actually found this project really fun. So hopefully that means it's not too scary. Um, now this project, I'd say, is probably just a little bit smaller uh, than project one in terms of the amount of code you have to write. But the thing that makes it harder is this, right? Uh, another goal is we want you guys to learn how to write integration tests. So when you build large systems, they're not necessarily in Java, right? Or they're not necessarily even just in one programming language. Often you need to be able to write tests that test the entire behavior of a whole system. So this is going to be a chance to dip our toes in those water. And uh, a lot of this video is going to be about that, uh, how to do that. Uh, and then lastly, we want you guys to learn how to start being more self-reliant in terms of, OK, so for example, I need to figure out a way if you know from the spec, to check if a file has changed since the last commit before I add it. So then finding and identifying these subtasks and then mining resources out there on the web for relevant code or ideas or, or looking in textbook uh, at textbooks out there is a really important skill. So Professor Koitzer in our department has said that one of the most important things whenever you go have a job someplace, once you're already in the door and you're working, one of the things that will be evaluated most strongly is your ability to mine the web for relevant code, to figure out how to solve problems. Uh, so we'll, of course, be here for support, uh, but we want you guys to give a really honest try whenever you get stuck on things in this project before you ask. Right? Uh, so <clears throat> tips-wise, given that we understand these motivations and what we expect from you, that we want it to be a more independent thing, um, I'm going to say, you know, it's Sunday, the projects do a little more Oh, do in a little more than a week, plus whatever slip days you may have available. Uh, so we ask that you try to start coding, and coding in earnest as soon as possible. Hopefully the week after spring break midterms are all gone. Um, and as I mentioned, the project's probably a bit smaller than project one, but there are a lot of places you can get stuck. Uh, and if you're trying to understand where do I even start, well, in the spec, actually, there's a sequence of commands that we describe uh, that you should start, uh, be able to write, starting with init, going through um, add and commit and so forth. So roughly this order is, is the right order to go in. Uh, and one of the most important things about implementing and testing a large system is that you need to develop things uh, in isolation. That is, you should have a separation of concerns here. So if I need to, for example, figure out how to copy a file, you should probably be writing helper methods and helper classes. Gigantic main functions, we really need to wean ourselves away from those. So in project one, uh, the design of the project, we gave you guys some exemplars of how at least I thought about how to break down a big system into a lot of pieces. So now it'll be your job to try and figure those out. Okay. So as an example of this notion, right, that's going to be, this is probably the most important thing that you need to get right for this project. Okay. So let's suppose we need to figure out how to make a copy of a file. This is a non-trivial task in Java. Uh, just that's the way it is. Okay. So it's not like Python where it takes you three seconds to Google and do it. Just be a little more work, okay? Uh, but that little more work can actually be a big pain. It's just big enough that if you try to add it incrementally to say, uh, if you have a big gitlet.java, um, you may decide, I need to learn how to, how to make a copy of a file so that when I do java gitlet commit, uh, then it makes a copy. Now I'm gonna say that 
there's roughly three approaches. I mean, I don't know. That's the way I broke it down to doing that, to going to the web and looking to see how do I, how do I actually make a copy of a file? So one approach is I open up gitlit.java and then I look up, say, Java copy file or whatever. And then I go to the first thing here and whatever it is. And then I try copying and pasting whatever, like, whatever this thing is uh, into gitlit.java. So if you try doing that with gitlit.java, well, what you're doing then, the only way you'll be able to actually test it is by opening up uh, or by running commands like this, right? So I would do like hello or something. Uh, and the problem with that approach is that it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, say you have an airplane and you want to add a new feature, like changing the locks in the bathroom. Now, it would be kind of crazy if the way you do it is you install the lock in the bathroom, but take off and like go on a flight that's 20 hours long, not realizing that maybe there is no way to lock the bathroom or even worse that the, the lock has a fire hazard that causes the whole, I don't know how you, let me really badly design lock, but if you somehow introduced a fire hazard and caught your whole bathroom on fire and plane explodes, that would be bad, right? When you build big systems, you test these things in isolation. So that's gonna be an extremely important point because it may be that what you thought was copying files, this thing you copied from the web, that it actually messes up your .gitlet folder and maybe the way you're testing that causes you great pain. So I will say that a much more natural approach, and you've probably done this if you've been you know, through 61A, is creating a separate file which is just like playing around dot pi or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so I've come up with file copy experiments dot Java where I'm going to do all the things I want to do with files or I'll, I'll, I'll literally create a new file copy experiments dot Java, try and figure out how does one copy files there. I'll test it manually and then maybe I'll copy and paste it into Gitlet or maybe I'll save it as file utils dot Java and then be able to use it from Gitlet. Um, so this approach is much, much, much better than this one. I just, it'll save you tons of headaches. Maybe not necessarily for this copying a file thing, but um, in general, I think it's a really good idea, right? Separating our concerns out. There's just too much, oops, inside of gitlit.java to be safe to try and uh, test things from the command line like this. Just much better if I can do, uh, you know, test bathroom lock, not in flight, right? That's just a nice thing to be able to do. Okay. Um, then I guess I'll mention there's the more industrial strength approach, which is, okay, actually, you know what? There's a whole lot of file stuff I need to do. So I'm gonna make my own separate package or library. I'm gonna call it fileutils.java or whatever. And actually write JUnit tests for it. And then just treat this as a separate sub project. And <clears throat> out there in the, the real-ish world, this is probably not a bad idea uh, because you're probably gonna share these utilities with a lot of people for a large project. No, for this specific project, I don't think that'll necessarily be the most time efficient uh, use of your time because writing this file will be a little tricky, but up to you, however you want to do it. But my main point is just don't try to cram everything in one big file, test and develop in isolation. So GitLit public test is a file we give you that, well, it comes with a few things. It has these three tests here that test uh, the log, checkout, initialize, add, commit, and that's it commands. Um, and that's fine, but the actual more important thing that GitLit public test GitLit public test provides you uh, are a number of methods that do things like create files, uh, or get text from a file, or run your GitLit commands, right? And I'll mention that you don't need to know how to use these methods work. Uh, you don't sorry, you don't need to know how they work in order to use them. Uh, so if you just trust that get text gets the text from a file, then who cares really what all this stuff is? So don't be too scared of this, and instead just trust these nice, lovely comments. Uh, in fact, I'll note that you use things all the time that you don't understand. So tree maps use a very sophisticated red black tree that you guys don't have to bother with the, the comprehension of. Uh, the difference here is that's a little awkward is that you're gonna be modifying this file while this source code is here. So it gets tempting to try and look inside, uh, but I would advise you that you don't have to, okay? But you can, and I'll talk a little bit about how they work in a bit. So let's go through maybe as an example of one of these tests, the thing that you should know how to do uh, let's let's uh, go over the, the key things, the key abstractions and methods that GitLit public test provides. So the first thing to bring up is that before any test runs, there's uh, this funny thing up here. Uh, and what this is, is a new feature of JUnit we've never used before, uh, where it's called before. And what it does is every time you run a test that has uh, at test at the beginning, it will run this code before it runs. What does this code do? Well, it explains up here in the text and you don't really have to read these details to get it, but uh, it deletes any existing gitlet system, that is any folder named .gitlet, as well as any folder named test files, 
uh, and then it creates the test files folder again. But it doesn't much matter, right? You can just say sets up the test, and that happens before every time you run a test. Okay. So in other words, every time you run a test, it does the equivalent of uh, this. All right. So that's that's what this before does. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now the next and most useful thing is there's this handy method called gitlet, which has this funny argument here uh, that runs your gitlet using the provided arguments. So let's look at an example of one of these tests. So whenever this test executes, the first thing that happens is this runs, does all that directory deletion and so forth, uh, and then it runs the init command of your gitlet. How does that work? Don't trouble yourselves with that for now. Just understand that when I say gitlet init, that calls the init command. The next thing that happens is it creates a file object. And if you haven't done any coding yet with files yet, this might seem a little strange. So I guess I'll mention that uh, you should think of creating a new file object. It's a, a pair of binoculars that points at one file on your computer. So I say new file, gitlet directory. So I focus on gitlet, uh, dot gitlet, and then I can ask questions like, okay, I'm looking through my binoculars. Is there something there? So f dot exists just tells us, does the binoc file binoculars, does it see the file I want? Okay, so that's all there is to the test. And what it does, is it tries to call the init command and then asserts that it actually creates the directory. Now let's suppose that uh, actually let's let's mention one more thing uh, about this gitlet command, uh, which is that it returns whatever would usually get printed uh, as a string. Okay, how does that work? Well, it uses whatever all this stuff is that you don't need to trouble yourselves with right now, but somehow it does this uh, and returns whatever is printed. So maybe let's write our own little test. Let me give you an example of another test we could write. Okay, tests that get init returns the right uh, string if uh, returns the right string if the gitlet folder exists. Okay. Now this might be a little bit of overkill as a test, but eh, why not? So in this case, what I'm going to do is gitlet init. So I know that the test has already deleted uh, everything a dot gitlet folder if it exists. So I'll do gitlet init, and I'll assert that this already exists. Now I'm going to call gitlet init again, and I'm going to say uh, printed output. All right, and then uh, I will assert it should be true that printed output contains. Um, well, I guess let's go look at the spec. So we look here and we see Java gitlet init uh, should send a message that looks something like this. Uh, I'll just say it should contain this. I don't want to deal with new line stuff. It should be close enough. Uh, so we assert true that this output should contain this, uh, and now let's try running it. Uh-oh, uh, basic initialize uh, better. I copy and pasted. Okay, so we compile and run it. And it seems to be passing all of our tests. Hooray. Okay, so that's the kind of abstraction I mean uh, that this thing provides for you. Right? So if you trust it, all's well. Uh, similarly, the gitlet command, so this funny thing where it says string dot dot dot. Uh, oops. Uh, what this does is say you can actually provide multiple strings. I'm not sure if I just said this a minute ago, uh, but we can, for example, say gitlet add wug.txt, uh, and that's the equivalent of doing java gitlet add wug.txt. Okay? Uh, and then, as we just saw, anything that your gitlet tries to print will get returned as a string. So that's the most important one. Now, there's some other things we can do. For example, this get text uh, command here. So we look at get text. So given a file name, it returns the contents of that file as a string. So that could be handy for reading in uh, files. So actually, before we use it, let's talk about a few more abstractions. There's also create file, which takes a given file name and some text and creates a file with that name and puts that text into it. Uh, and there's a similar one called write file that assumes the file already exists. Uh, so let's try out create file. To understand how create file is useful to us, Let's talk about how we can use it as a way to test the uh, status command. So what I'm going to do is let's uh, write a test that uh, tests that after we add five files that uh, they appear in the status message. Okay. So that's my goal. So how can I use those abstractions here to write what would be an annoying test? I mean, let's let's maybe talk about what it would entail to do this test manually. So what I might do manually is I might create wug1.txt, let's say wug1, okay, and then wug2.txt, and say wug2, 
Alright, whatever. And I'll only do two here. And I would do rm rf dot get lit java get lit init java get lit add wug one dot text java get lit add wug two dot text java get lit status. Uh, and I see that these two files are staged. Great. So that gives me a sense that staging seems to be generating the appropriate status message. That's a nice thing. Now the trouble is that that was a bit annoying to have to type out all of those commands and it'd be extra annoying if maybe I broke those commands later. So how could I do that automatically? So let's do public void, add five files, verify, uh, and verify status. I don't know, something like that. And it's up to you to figure out what tests you think are useful, uh, but this is just the one I picked here. So I'm gonna say, what if I had five files? All right. Uh, and uh, in this case, well, what do I do? So what did I actually do here when I look at the commands I ran? Well, I did java git lit init. So it probably makes sense to do git lit init first. Uh, and then I need to create some files. Well, rather than using vi, I'll use create file. Uh, and let's do string uh, wug file name equals testing directory. And copying from up here, which says put it in the folder test files. So I don't you know, fill up the current directory. Uh, so let's do wug plus i plus dot text. And I'll do some wug text and we'll just say, I don't know, doesn't really matter, dummy. Okay, they all have the same information. Okay, uh, then I'll create a file named wug file name, which has wug text. Then I'll do git lit. Okay, so the question is, if I did git lit add wug one text and wug two text, well in this case I'm gonna do add uh, and wug file name. And then finally, I guess we can assert true that, oh, let's do string status output equals git lit dot, or git lit status. Uh, and then we do assert true, uh, let's say status output contains, and then I'll just do wug three dot text because I'm lazy, but I could be more thorough and write another loop. But you know, you, I hope you get the basic idea. I'm only gonna look and make sure that wug3 is actually there. Uh, so we do java git lit public test. We see that, all right, all my tests are passing. Now you may be wondering what's up with this when I run my test that it seems to be printing stuff. Um, and uh, that brings us to our last uh, abstraction we hope that you'll find useful maybe uh, is extract commit messages. So what it does is takes everything that git lit prints out and if it happens to, for example, contain a bunch of uh, equal signs, so if I do java git lit log, for example, it finds all the messages separated by quadruple equals and then returns them as an array of strings. Uh, and perhaps not great uh, design on our part, we decided to include a print line here. Uh, that's why every time you run any test that involves extracting commit messages, it is printing. Feel free to take that out of your version of git lit public test. Okay, uh, and then I guess one more method I'll mention is there's a recursive delete method. We don't intend for you to use it, but you're welcome to use it if you want. So punchline, writing tests for this project are not so bad as long as you trust and use the abstractions that we've provided. Okay, now um, I guess it's worth mentioning that there is some interesting stuff inside of these abstractions, these methods that you don't have to understand. For example, writing a file. So I want to warn you real quick that while write file and create file uh, and where is it, uh, get text, while these should work fine for files which contain only plain text like this, things that we can read, that we can open in Sublime or Emacs or whatever, that it will, these methods will work fine with these kind of files. But when it comes to binary files, like say images or JPEGs or something like that, uh, this technique may not work. So for those of you who are thinking, oh, I'll just use create file and get text in order to make copies of the files I need. Remember that was our, our straw man of, a, of an example of a thing you need to do. I'll warn you there's some danger, okay? So these methods are only guaranteed to work for plain text. And if you try to use them to copy, say a JPEG image, they may not work, okay? So let me just mention uh, this potential annoying uh, pitfall. So every file on your computer, of course, is just a sequence of ones and zeros. It's binary, right? And every string is just a sequence of character objects. As we know from that somewhat oddly placed lecture in the semester about uh, integers, a care object is just a 16-bit number. Um, and, and so as a result, it seems only natural that maybe get text could work. 
I read a file, it gets turned into bytes, and then I return it as a string. Now I'm going to warn you that it is dangerous to take arrays of bytes and turn them into a string and expect for it to work for any file. It'll work for plain text, uh, but it's possible for it to mess up, right? So I'm just going to say that if you're using these as inspiration for how to write your code that copies files, I would highly recommend that you never ever turn anything into a string and instead stick to only reading and writing byte arrays directly when dealing with files. Now, I know that probably doesn't make a ton of sense to you right now, but when you get into the nitty gritty of trying to write files and read files, uh, it may make more sense. And so just my admonition to you is that stick to byte arrays whenever you're dealing with data, if you don't want to uh, have strange issues with new lines or whatever else. Okay? And so just a vague warning, right? Do not use these as your way to make copies of files. It may not work on someone else's computer, even if it works on yours. If you're curious, you can check out uh, this write-up right here. Okay. Now you may be wondering why it is that something seems to keep getting printed every time I call Java git lit public test. Well, that's because of a little tiny bug in the current version where uh, this function is being chattier than it ought to be. So I don't know, let's fix that. Okay, now it's not doing that anymore. Sorry, that shouldn't have been there. But anyway, uh, so what is this last? So uh, in this video, the last thing I wanna bring up is this uh, extract commit messages method that you might find useful. And what it does is given a log output like this, uh, it returns each of the commit messages as an array of commit messages. So you give it this whole blah and it gives you back an array containing each of these strings. Okay, uh, so that's, and then, well, there's also this one called recursive delete that will delete files recursively. It's not intended for your use, but I don't know, maybe you'll find it useful, but it's mostly just there so the at before thing works. Okay, so that's it for the core part of this video, but I will make uh, a little bit of uh, a foray inside of these abstractions. So you don't have to know how create file and gitlet works. You don't need to know what this is or what this is or any of that. Uh, but I think it is worth bringing up one important point. So for those of you guys who find it interesting and wanna know how this stuff works, uh, the warning is that while the git text and create file methods seem like they might be useful for your actual project, not just for testing, there is a danger. So for example, if I say git text, right? That's the way this, uh, we, we already saw how this works a little bit, git text wug file name. Uh, let's suppose I did git text, uh, let's say um, potato famine dot PNG, right? I don't know, I had a potato famine picture on my computer. So in theory, what you might imagine is, you know what, Josh, strings, I mean, they're just some, information so can i read in like a image file as a string and the funny and annoying thing is that those methods create uh, create file and get text while it might seem tempting to use them to read any old file uh, it might not work what's even worse is it might work on your computer but not on someone else's so what i'll say is that if a file contains so-called binary data as opposed to plain text data like this something i can read these i'm not going to guarantee they work there may be situations you can run into where they won't work. So to reiterate this and, and mention a little bit here, just a warning uh, is that, okay, while it is true that every file on your computer is just ones and zeros and every string is just a sequence of character objects, which as we know from lecture five long ago, a CHAR and Java is just a 16 bit number. Well, it seems like there should be an easy mapping between these and it should be perfectly fine to do uh, this sort of thing. There is a danger, okay? Um, so what I'm going to say is that instead, it is a much better idea that instead of storing what is inside of a file as a string, if you're not specifically using only plain text files, like we are in these testing uh, situations, uh, then it's a better idea to use byte arrays. And actually, if you look carefully, I mean, if you want, at get text, how does it start? Well, it reads all bytes from a file uh, and then returns them as a string. But if you wanted to actually read the contents of a file, I mean, it would make more sense to uh, return just this, right? We wouldn't want to actually transform it to a string. And that is guaranteed to work for any file, okay? So the, the native language of files on a computer, if you'd like, is byte. And if you try to change things back and forth between bytes and strings, you can run into trouble. So just a warning for those of you guys who try to draw inspiration from our framework in order to write uh, your programs, you could run into some trouble. But uh, I don't know, maybe that's a little too much. Okay, uh, oop, that even shouldn't be there. So that's GitLit in a nutshell. Uh, I think that 
you should find it hopefully as fun as we did. And yeah, let us know what you think. All right, see you around.